from Detroit, and I saw the comment earlier about our driving. It's true. <laughs> and we're a city that needs to get our mojo back. We've had taken, taken a number of them on the chin. And I'd actually like to share with you a few ideas of what we're going to do to get our mojo back and what I believe that we can all do together to drive progress and success in our respective businesses. Before we do that, though, I want you to think back for a second. Remember Hurricane Katrina? Imagine this. Imagine it's one week before the hurricane. You know it's coming. What would you do? How would you prepare? Well, in 2008, an economic hurricane tore through our country, and the results were devastating. People lost their jobs, their hopes, their dreams. Today, we live in a world of exponential complexity, ruthless competition, and dizzying speed. Today, it's always a week before the hurricane. And what happened at that point wasn't just a downturn in the economy. What happened was that the rules of the game fundamentally changed forever. We could no longer rely on the models of the past in order to win. Today, an entirely new set of skills are needed. Today, it's always one week before the hurricane. So I thought you could help me out here for a minute and help me identify a specific company. Which company has a mission statement that goes something like this? To organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Anybody? I heard it. Google. Now here's a little trickier one. Which company had basically that same mission statement for 219 years in a row before Google was even founded? I heard it right up here. Encyclopedia Britannica. They were the Google of their day. By the way, I wonder, you know how nowadays we run around and Google's a verb, like, I got to go Google him? You think 150 years ago, people were going like, let me get right back to you. I got to go Britannica that. I mean, these folks were in the information age 100 years before the Industrial Revolution. Cool company, all this technology, they were rocking until the hurricane struck. Hurricane Microsoft. So Microsoft comes in, and with one blow of disruptive creativity, Britannica never recovered. So Microsoft goes on to become the dominant source of information in the world. Everything is going great. They have more money than most small countries. Until once again, the hurricane struck. Hurricane Wikipedia, in this case. A startup. A non-profit startup. And Microsoft, with all their might and all their power, ended up shutting down Encarta in 2009. Who will dislodge Wikipedia? We can hardly imagine it, but it's likely to happen took over 200 years for Britannica to fall, only 15 for Microsoft. So what we're seeing is these hurricane strength winds are coming with increasing force at an increasing pace. It's one week before the hurricane. You know it's coming. What will you do? Now, some companies managed to do fantastic things. 2008, my friends in Chicago at Groupon, in the eye of the storm, launched a disruptive company, and has managed to create billions of dollars of wealth. So you say, okay, well, I'm not a startup company. What about, what about our firm? Well, in my backyard, our very own Ford Motor Company, when their competitors facing the same seemingly insurmountable challenges were running for bankruptcy protection, Ford doubled down on innovation. Today, they're enjoying record profits as a result. So the problem is that we're too busy being heads down in the challenges of the day that we fail to see the opportunities ahead of us. We've all heard that expression, right? Your head's down on a project. Think about what you see when your head's down. I mean, try it. On the other hand, what about when your head's up? You notice things. You notice emerging trends in technology. You notice what your competition's doing. You notice somebody else taking a little stab at reinventing the meetings and event business altogether. So I would suggest to you today, folks, that we need to spend more time in our organizations, in our families, and even in our communities being heads up instead of being heads down. Now, unfortunately, we have a big problem in this country. 
And that problem is that our creativity overall is declining rather than rising to meet the challenges of the day. Newsweek ran a cover story last year. They talked about the creativity crisis. They revealed a study where they measured creativity in kids. For decades, it had been on the rise, but about 15 years ago, we saw a sharp decline. Why? What's going on? Well, maybe I can explain a little bit of it. It's a picture of my daughter, Chloe. Thank you. She is cute. <laughs> anyway, last year, Chloe was in fourth grade, and the teacher says, Chloe, go draw a picture of a bear. Cool, no problem, right? So she goes and draws this bear, and it's funky shaped and purple colors, and she's all excited, you know? So she runs up to that teacher and hands her the page. She's waiting for praise and admiration. You know what that teacher said? Chloe, that's not what bears look like. Bears aren't that color. Go back and redo it. So what happened in that moment wasn't that my daughter's creativity went away, because that's her gift as a human being. That's all of our gifts as human being. But she learned a terrible lesson that we teach again and again throughout our country. Funny. You ever see one of these? Does anyone know what that is? An ugly doll. It's not what bears look like. Weird. Well, ugly dolls are all funky shapes and colors, and Ugly Doll managed to go on to become an enormous entrepreneurial success story. They were the 2007 Toy of the Year. And in fact, when Sasha Obama went to her first day of school in Washington, D.C., she went clutching tightly to the security of her Ugly Doll. So we see a disconnect. We teach this, but we reward that. We're taught in school to follow the rules, guess what the teacher knows, there's only one right answer, and whatever you do, don't make any mistakes. But if you do that in the real world, that's a surefire path to mediocrity. Doing exactly the opposite is what enables each of us to reach our highest potential. So what's going on, unfortunately, is that we don't grow into creativity, we're growing out of it. And, I mean, you know it. Think back when you were a kid. There was no such thing as a cardboard box, was there? It was a fort or a Barbie mansion or a pirate ship. You put a bunch of kids in a room with toys and art supplies, they'll play for hours with endless imagination. You put us in that same room, we're checking our Blackberries in 45 seconds. <laughs> so over time, our schools and our systems and our bureaucracy, they beat it out of us. And we become the thing that we fear the most. Grumpy adults, a.k.a. our parents. And by the way, not the cool parents in the Viagra commercials. <laughs> well, now that I've bummed you out, there's actually good news. And there's really good news. Harvard University does a study in 2008, and they ask the age-old question, is creativity born or is it developed? Is it nature or nurture? Here's what they found. Creativity, in fact, is 85% learned behavior. Now think about what that means. That means you and I, on our groggiest day, have 85% the creative capacity as Mozart or Da Vinci or Picasso. So how do we get it out? How do we get that creativity to come on out to play? The first thing is awakening curiosity. Curiosity is like the building block of creativity. And the simplest way to do that is ask these three questions again and again and again. Why, what if, and why not? Why, what if, and why not? Example, an entrepreneur in New York was launching a sock company. She was going to make girls' socks. Well, the normal business school playbook would be, you go overseas, find a really low-cost provider, manufacture these boring white utilitarian socks as cheap as you can, then you fly over to Bentonville, Arkansas, beg Walmart to sell your socks. A dollar will get you 12 pair. This woman, though, did something different. She really questioned things. She said, why, what if, and why not? Why do socks have to be boring? What if socks were fun and creative expressions? Why do socks match? Why do socks even come in pairs of two? Like, you always lose one. So anyway, this woman launches this cool company called Little Mismatched. Now, Little Mismatched, you can't buy socks that match. They're color-coordinated, but they don't match. They're fun and whimsical and cool. In fact, you can't even buy a pair of socks at all because they come in sets of three or five. 
Now, this company went from zero to $30 million in revenue in four years. Giant entrepreneurial success story because she challenged conventional wisdom, because she dared to be different, because she refused to be another Me Too player. Because let's face it, the world doesn't need another Me Too anything. So I had the privilege of writing a book on creativity. I interviewed over 200 thought leaders, uh, billionaires, artists, musicians, entrepreneurs, and tried to share some of their success stories and how they unleash creative capacity. Dyson, I think, is kind of a cool story. In his case, he launched this amazing vacuum cleaner, but the part of the story you might not know is that he failed 5,100 times before getting it right. Literally 5,100 failed experiments in a row. What do most of us do? We don't even try. And if we try, we give up if the going gets tough. He realized that failures, those mistakes, are simply the portals of discovery. Now, one cool company that I interviewed for the book does just that. They have a failure of the year award. So they have a big banquet, and they celebrate the team member of the year and the rookie of the year and the failure of the year. And they say, this is for the team or individual that went out on a limb. The numbers look great. Everything was smart, and it didn't work, at all, work out at all. Wow. Think about the message that that sends into the DNA of this company. It's okay to take responsible risks. It's okay to be creative. Another company I interviewed issues every team member two corporate get-out-of-jail-free cards every year. They say, here, go out there, be creative, and if you really screw something up, you hand us one of these cards and you're off the hook. On the annual reviews, the team members will be, the, the team leaders will be disappointed with the team member if they haven't used both of them. So you'd say, is it risky? Perhaps. You think that company comes up with great ideas? Absolutely they do. So last year I was carving a pumpkin like we all do. And you know, I carve it from the top. And you stick your arms in, you get that goop all over. And you go to light it, you know, and you put your hand in, you get the second degree burns. You try to lug it around, you got to get way underneath the thing and walk around. So I'm complaining about this to my partner, Dan Gilbert, he's the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, and I'm, I'm partners with him in a venture capital firm. He starts laughing at me. He says, Josh, you're doing all wrong. Carve it from the bottom. I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, think about it. You carve it from the bottom, you get to use gravity. All the stuff just drops right out. You go to light it, you put a candle in the base, gently place the pumpkin over the top, no burns. You want to carry it around, you get to use the handle that nature intended. Brilliant, right? And I'm telling you, by the way, no one in this room will ever carve a pumpkin the same way again. But the thing is that we don't challenge conventional wisdom. We're so used to doing things the way that we've always done them that we fail to unleash the creativity that we all have inside of us on the big things, product invention, and on the little things like carving pumpkins. Now, one fun technique I'd like to share with you is called role storming. Role storming is like brainstorming, but in character. So here's what happens. If I'm brainstorming as myself and I'm in a room of colleagues, I might start to say, well, is someone going to be offended by my idea? What's my boss going to think? Will I get laughed at? Is it foolish? But if I brainstorm as Steve Jobs, no one's going to laugh at me. Or if I brainstorm as Charlie Sheen or Oprah. So I'm telling you, it sounds a little goofy, but give it a try. In your next brainstorming session, brainstorm as your favorite sports hero or literary figure or politician you'll be amazed at the creativity that you'll unleash. So talking about my hometown, Detroit, I'd just like to wrap up with this. In November, I launched a firm, Detroit Venture Partners, to help rebuild Detroit through entrepreneurship. We're funding internet startup companies. Last week, we made a major announcement. Our fourth partner came on, Magic Johnson, who's really a crusader for, for urban renewal, and it's just a privilege to be working with them. But anyway, I wanted to show you how creativity wins in the real world, in the world of business, in a highly competitive world like venture capital. So we've all seen one of these things, right? This is a, called a CAPTCHA. Have you ever seen one of these when you're filling out a form online? Anyone like it? It's awful, right? So these things simply pr protect the site to see if you're a human or you're a computer bot. They anger consumers. There are all kinds of drop-up, and they're not even that secure. This is the way that the rest of the world solves it, this is the way a company we just funded solves it. I can't, I don't know if you can read it, so let me just read it to you real briefly. It says, drag three pepperonis and two mushrooms onto the middle pizza. They looked at the world in a new way, 
They dared to be different. They realized that remarkable wins, and they unleashed their creative capacity. That's what we're doing in Detroit, and that's what I hope you do in the meetings and event industry and with your respective clients. Thank you very much.